Good morning, everybody. My name is John Spence. I'm the director of Your Community Arts Partnership. In this curtain speech, I, of course, have to start off by thanking our sponsors. This is the seventh Spring Wright Literary Festival. And we thank, from the beginning, NISCA, New York State Council of the Arts. They're the folks that uh, originally came up with the idea. They said, you folks have a lot of literary talent up there. You know, and, and there is no literary festival anywhere upstate in your region. You should do that. And I think they promised us something crazy like, I don't know, $15,000 to get it started. When the check actually came, it was 3000 <laughs> But resourceful folks that we are, we made it happen anyway. And as I say, this is the seventh year. So thank you. Uh, you've made it. You're here, as Jimmy Fallon says. This is the place to be. Uh, and so more sponsors, uh, NISCA, the Tompkins County Tourism Program, generously supports our efforts. And this year's uh, festival sponsor is Wegmans. And I'd also like a round of applause for Buffalo Street Books. I am pleased and proud to turn this over to Yvonne Fisher. We've been looking forward to this. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm just going to read an eclectic mix of things that are different styles and different content. And uh, <clears throat> I've been playing lately with some slam poetry, which I can't really define, <laughs> but I uh, have my version of it. And one of them is a welcome, a little welcome thing that I wrote. Uh, hey. This is my welcome. I have a few things to say. It really doesn't matter, but I'll say them anyway. I don't want to be shallow. I want to be deep. I want to be funny, and I'd like you all to weep. Just don't fall asleep. I'm doing some slam, some ranting and raving, and in between that I'll be smiling and waving. I'm doing some stories, some old and some new. I hope you enjoy them. I hope I do too. I'm taking a chance I don't often do, but I'm feeling kind of safe with all you. I'm aiming to entertain and have a good time. I'm grateful to be here, and that's a good sign. I want us to shine. I want to make you mine. You're all looking fine. <laughs> Let's kick out the jams and have a good time. <laughs> um, this next one is also in that slam style. I wrote it a few years ago. It's about the environment, and it's unfortunately still relevant. And uh, it's not autobiographical, although it may sound like it is. <laughs> it's called Modern Life. I stand here in my radon house drinking my chlorine coffee. My cream's enhanced with BHG, genetically engineered just for me. My toast is thick with trans fatty spread. I can't believe it's not butter. I listen to the radio with real bad news while I watch acid rain run off my roof. I breathe in deep petrochemical goop. The yoga breath of life doesn't feel too good. Talking on my cell phone electrocutes my brain. My hair dye seeps into my roots, makes me insane. <laughs> my Fiji plastic water leaches to my liver. Drink eight glasses a day really tastes so bitter. The toxic sun streams through the ozone layer, tans my burned out skin, thinking I'm a player. Filling up my Humvee, want to pimp my ride, fossil fuel leaks onto my hands, nowhere to hide. I look up and see the bird flu flying low in the sky, and the bird shit is falling on my third eye. <laughs> I'm sitting here watching reality TV, got eliminated and have to go home now, you see. I eat salted chips of hydrogenated oil, crispy and fried. I drink battery acid with a beer chaser, feels like I died. I belch in a burp and I fart all day, then I go to sleep at night and dream my terror-filled conspiracy dreams, give me night sweats and make me want to fight. I toss and I turn on my soap-through sheets, I grind my teeth in my bed, and after a while of doing that, I take an Ambien and sleep like I am dead. Seven hours later, I wake up with a start. I'm holding on to my head. I'm refreshed. I'm renewed. I'm replenished. I'm refined. I got positive affirmations in my mind. I turn on the radio and whatever horrible shit they say, I'm ready for another fucking brand new day. <laughs> 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 
not not to clap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This next one I wrote in one of Z's groups, and it's called An Ode to Dance. I danced the Lindy Hop as a kid, awkwardly and stiff as a board, afraid of moving my body and afraid of the boys and girls I was dancing with. It was way too intimate for my shy little self. Then came the twist, which was freer and looser, but still I was self-conscious and scared. I sang the let's twist again like we did last summer, but I always thought I was doing it wrong. Then came the hippie years with free form dance, no partners, swing your arms in all directions, sway and undulate, do the pony, do the mashed potato, do the jerk, do the swim, and a hundred other moves. Take drugs, let go, move to the music, free yourself, transcend your body, become one with the other dancers. At the Beans in Central Park in New York City in People's Park in Berkeley, California, create a whole undulating world of sensual, vibrating, pulsating movement. I was just discovering ways my body could move in the world and the ways my mind could expand and let go. Oh yeah, I got my mojo on and I moved to the groove. Then came the gay revolution in New York City, dark, loud, massive clubs late at night that smelled of amyl, nitrate, tequila, and pot. Lighting that felt like we were somewhere out in space. Strobe, white, infrared, disco ball swirling around while half-naked men danced wildly with each other. The floor so crowded you could barely shake your hips, but shake our hips we did. To the pulse of the beat and the bass and the rhythm, to Diana Ross and Patti LaBelle and all the great divas, voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? The intensity and raw, steaming, sweaty sexuality was palpable, pulsating, boom, 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 and you didn't even know who you were dancing with. All that mattered was the beat and the rhythm and the sensual explosion. Meanwhile, in our little commune in Staten Island, we were dancing every night after dinner. Someone would cook and we would eat enthusiastically and then someone would put Aretha on the record player. What you want, baby, I got it. What you need, you know I got it. And we would all get up and dance in a big circle, smiling at each other, imitating the way each one of us would dance. We knew each other so well. We laughed together as we danced. We felt free in our family of choice, living for pleasure and living for love. And then the AIDS crisis hit us like a ton of bricks. We took care of each other and of many friends we lost. We marched and protested and shouted out, and we never stopped dancing. We poured out our grief with dance. I remember feeling like I couldn't believe that so many friends were sick or dying, and my body could still move through space without flying off the planet. Then for many years, I didn't dance that much. My life was elsewhere. I was doing other things. I was getting older. I was doing my career. I was a more serious person. Dance was less important. But more recently, I discovered Zumba. <laughs> for the last several years, I have been a dancing fool. I dance now for exercise, for fun, for nostalgia, for freedom, for my body and mind. I dance for my soul, to keep young, to grow old wildly and ungracefully, to bring back the twist, the jerk, the swim, the pony. All the dances of my youth back again. No inhibitions this time. I dance like no one is watching and hopefully no one is. <laughs> I dance to salsa and Latin beats, to hip hop and African rhythms. I feel the ethnic connections from all over the world in my body. I move, I swing, I fly, I dance to keep me alive, and I hope I'll dance till I die. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this next one is called Motive, and uh, the inspiration was when there were all these um, shootings and mass shootings, which keep happening and have been happening. And uh, the media was always saying they were looking for a motive. What you know? What's the motive? What's the motive? And I just reacted to that. 
because he was troubled and he had a gun. Because he was a loner and he had a gun. He was rejected and he had a gun. He was in a bad mood, he was angry, he was scared. He was depressed and he had a gun. He was a right-wing militant. He hated the government, he hated women. He was following a kid in a hoodie and he had a gun. He felt threatened. He hated gay people, black people, brown people, immigrants, Mexicans, Arabs, Muslims. He wanted a revolution. He wanted to protect his home, his family, his cattle, his women, his guns. He was crazy and he had a gun. He wasn't crazy and he had a gun. He was a Nazi, he was feeling sad, he was worried, quiet. He went off and he had a gun. They played music too loud, they stopped for gas. At the gas station, he had a gun. At the restaurant, at Target, at the movie theater, in a church, he had a gun. In a church, he had a gun. He shot the people in the church. Walking around, he had a gun. Open carry, he had a gun. He shot the toddler, he had a gun. The child shot his father, he found a gun. He was paranoid, he thought he saw a shadow. He was wearing a uniform and he had a gun. He was taught to shoot, he was militarized. He had a rifle, a semi-automatic, he had a shield. He was armed to the teeth. He heard someone say, hands up don't shoot, but he had a gun, and he had a gun. He was unbalanced, he was just a boy, he went into the school, he was upset, he had a grudge, he was mad at someone. He went into the school and he shot the little children because he had a gun, because he had a gun, because he had a gun. Thank you. Okay changing the tone a bit. Here's a great game to play. What are your favorite words? Serendipity, synchronicity, sojourn, solipsism, incantation, illumination, luminous, some for meaning and innuendo, another favorite by the way, innuendo, interloper, some for the sound, the very sound it makes falls trippingly off the tongue, trippingly, yes, assiduously, incandescent. Oh, have you ever heard a word more exquisite in your life? When the sound and the meaning come together, onomatopoeia, when they come together and explode in your brain and expand your mind and all around space and time and catapult you, catapult, yes like a shooting star into the continuum, the galaxy, the cosmos, all words, by the way, that I adore. Cosmology, the meaning and the sound. Come together right now. Yes, the Beatles said it best. Shake it up, baby. <laughs> Suddenly every word sounds beautiful, meaningful to my ears, like a poem in a polemic. Acquiescence, acquiescence, I have to say it twice. <laughs> Alchemy, Deuteronomy, brioche. Oh my God, don't get me started on French words. Oiseau, rien, ciel, croissant, Quebec, la mer. They put us to shame with their poetry of sound. They make us seem crass and crude, which we are. Yes, we are. I do like crass and crude quite a bit, don't you? <laughs> Crux, koi, coriander, crisp, coronation. The hard sea thrills me somehow. The sound of curses thrill me too, properly placed. Fuck. Fucked up. Motherfucker. Fuck me. Fuck you. We're fucked. Thrilling, exciting, powerful, <laughs> glorious. I like to slip in a curse. It spices things up. The beauty of ugliness, the paradox of life, the irony, the sarcasm, everything a joke. Apocalyptic dystopia, asphyxiation, aphasia, free associate, photosynthesis, foreshadow, verklempt. Ah, Yiddish words. Beautiful.
beautiful and ugly, pointed and descriptive, schmaltz, schmutz, schlub, schlemiel, schmuck, schoa, verkackte, verschluggene, vergessen, words from my childhood, from my history, from forever ago, from my ancestors, from the shtetl. Words are our fruit, our mangoes, all juicy and delicious. I eat words, I swallow them, I spit them out, I spray them all around. Words coming out of my mouth, my eyes, my ears, swirling around the room, this room trippingly on our tongues. My tongue, your tongue, words are our symbols, the way we reach out and touch. Without words, we'd be mute. Words are playing in the air, evoking, provoking, incanting, outsourcing, sliding, slipping, singing, singing, a souffle, a song. This next one is more of a story. Story. It's about my childhood. It's called Sanctuary. As a child, I felt everyone's pain and sorrow deep in my little solar plexus. I was too empathic, it was all I knew how to be. I was in touch and in tune with everyone and anyone's lost, sorrowful, disappointed pockets of darkness inside them. I understood and connected deeply, silently. I embraced them to my core without even knowing it. I was an empath and I enjoyed my suffering greatly. So when I watched the old movie, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, with Charles Lawton, the greatest actor of all time, in one of the greatest movies of all time, from one of the greatest books of all time, when I watched it on our little black and white TV set in our little apartment in Queens, New York, I was ready to have my heart broken open and shattered in pieces. Lawton's hunchback, Quasimodo, was so deformed and so sweet and so in love with the beautiful Esmeralda, so protective of her that I thought I would die. People chased him through the streets of Paris. Everyone stared at him, mocked him, ostracized him horribly because he was different. And all he wanted was love and acceptance like everyone else. And I loved him deeply. I wanted to take care of him, let him know he's okay and keep him safe. And I was him, feeling different, lonely, ostracized myself, an immigrant in a family that spoke German most of the time. We didn't fit at all and we pretended that we did. But I knew secretly, I knew we were the hunchback of Notre Dame. The shame of escaping the Holocaust was somehow in my bones. The chase and fleeing and longing for safety was my inheritance. No one told me this, but I knew. And I wanted to protect us in our deformity and difference. My father who stumbled to work every day and came home late and could hardly walk. My mother with her highfalutin red hair and her old world pride in our low class housing project. I was ashamed of her and how she didn't fit, and I loved her so fiercely I could barely speak. I was so quiet and busy inside trying to figure it all out, and I never could. And my little brother Michael, who was more outgoing and American than the rest of us, but he struggled in school and needed help, and I tried to help him, and I couldn't. I could barely help myself. I was in a kind of dreamland most of the time, filled with longing and fantasy. So when the hunchback ran into the church of Notre Dame and cried out, Sanctuary! Sanctuary! I sobbed with reluctant hope. And when he climbed the tower to the roof and looked out to the angry crowds standing below, my heart was in my throat. And then he looked at the powerful, animal-like, otherworldly gargoyles guarding the roof, the tower, and all who went there. And he said to them, why was I not made of stone like thee? In his distraught, hopeless, sensitive British whisper, I was undone. Why was I not made of stone like thee? I was a puddle on the floor, and through that unmitigated despair, I joined the hunchback, and I felt transformed, first into nothingness, 
and then into all there is, into something beyond the pain, beyond something I cannot describe except to say that I was lifted up somehow. Through the despair, I was comforted and lifted up, above sorrow and all else, above myself and my pain. And I found sanctuary, sanctuary somewhere in my soul. So the next one is about my group, my family of friends who used to live in a commune together and have remained friends. And it's from two years ago. It's called The Group on the 4th of July, 1914. It is two and a half hours before the fireworks begin. We are all gathered at Allen's Cottage on the west side of Cayuga Lake. It is so beautiful there, like another world. And yet it is also a little like Brighton Beach in Brooklyn because all the houses are so close together and everybody knows each other, what each other is doing. But the neighbors are all friendly and helpful and lovely. It is Ithaca, after all. Alan's cottage is painted pink on the outside. It's small and sweet. It looks like a princess's cottage in a fairy tale in Switzerland. That's Alan's taste. It's adorable. <laughs> on July 4th, 24 of us were gathered together not for any fireworks, but just to be with each other. We have been together as a group for more than 40 years. We are indeed a family of friends. This year was special because our friend Luna, who is Italian and who lives in Tuscany, was visiting for three weeks before going on a Buddhist retreat in Massachusetts. Also, our friend Sal was visiting from New York City. He's been through a rough time. Besides having AIDS for over 20 years, he's had cancer and diabetes in the last three years. It's a miracle he's still alive. Yet he's sharp-witted, droll, with a constant sense of humor, and he doesn't miss a thing. So many of our group are or have been sick or infirmed over the years. We've also lost many friends and loved ones to AIDS and other illnesses and tragedies when we were still young. It's astonishing to me, but I guess it's how life is, or can be. And now as we get older, it's happening more and more. One of our friends just got out of the hospital for a heart blockage and they put two stents in, yet here he was, exuberant as ever, filled with a life force that defies the fates. And here were two other women friends, a couple about to fly to Costa Rica in a few weeks. One of them just finished chemotherapy for ovarian cancer and is now in remission. She's been through hell and she looks so strong and healthy. The weekend before, we were all gathered in their backyard for their wedding celebration. It was lovely and touching and fun. The human spirit is indomitable when it can be. Too many women in the group are survivors of breast cancer and at least one has died from it. Yet here was her daughter wearing polka dot high heel shoes <laughs> with her girlfriend and eight-year-old son. Even the children in the group have huge challenges. One has a deadly nut allergy, can't be anywhere around nuts, has to carry an EpiPen with him at all times, and is afraid to eat anything outside his own home. He was just in the emergency room the day before and they didn't even know what triggered it. Yet he rises above, he's smart and gorgeous and a happy boy. Another child of the group visiting is five years old and has been transgender for three years. Born a boy, she thinks, dresses, looks, acts, and feels like a girl, and therefore she is a girl. And though we worry about an obstacle-ridden life, she is happy, free, beautiful, creative, a leader, very social and popular, and a great swimmer, and proud of it. We are an interesting and motley crew. At one point, we looked over at the neighbors who were also having a party. They had a long, beautiful table set outside with a tablecloth, great food, the wine was flowing with stemware and cloth napkins, and they all looked so normal. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, who's to say what they've been through? One thing I've learned in this life, things are never what they seem to be and never what they look like and nobody gets a free ride. Life is hard, and life is beautiful. <coughs> so looking over at the neighbor's party, Sal said in his thick Brooklyn accent, 
They look like a Norman Rockwell painting. <laughs> and they did. And then I looked around at our overcrowded porch and living room where the World Cup was blaring on the TV and the dock where the children were jumping up and down with glee and excitement and the rest of us were crowded together eating and drinking, all talking at once and laughing, catching up and connecting, comparing ailments and food restrictions. <laughs> and I noticed that our group looked more like a comic book by R. Crumb. <laughs> or a cartoon by Roz Chast from The New Yorker. We were all crooked and disheveled and wacky. <laughs> and looking around, I felt a profound love for all of us and for all people everywhere, for all of life, for the brokenness and impermanence and for the resilience and blessings and for those still hanging around being strong and for those out there somewhere hopefully watching over us all. Thank you. So this next section is from um, my stories that I wrote about my mother, which I had uh, compiled into a whole thing. But these are just highlights. And um, I may do a reading of the whole thing at some future point. But for now, I'll just do this. And um, it's, I chose a few of the funnier ones, except the first one's not that funny, and the last one's not that funny. Anyway, <laughs> you be the judge of that. <laughs> so um, the first one's called Tell Me Everything. For years, I've been planning to perform a one-woman show about my mother, about me and my mother, our relationship, and how I saw her about my perspective and how I interpreted her perspective, about getting inside her and seeing the world the way she did, the way she experienced life and my reactions to her and our reactions to each other. Okay, it would be about me, really. <laughs> it would be a lot about me. And it would be about her. It would be about her, too. It would be about us. In it, I would say everything there is to say. I would reveal all. I would tell everything. My mother would say, nobody has to know our business. I would tell how she grew up in Vienna with everything she ever wanted, how she went skiing in Salzburg, went to concerts in bejeweled theaters, about her strict mother and her sweet father, and Zachatort mit Schlag, Jewish culture, her twin baby brothers who died of whooping cough as infants her sister Greta, who got severely punished for being bad all the time, and her youngest brother, who everyone called Booby, who was sweet like her father, and their happy childhood until the Nazis took over. Nobody has to know our business. I don't like to think about it. Nobody can talk about this. I tell about the neighbors who turned into Nazis overnight. <coughs> I tell about rocks being thrown and windows breaking and her family being pulled out of their house in the middle of the night and made to wash the ground outside on their hands and knees and forced to leave their house with everything in it and move someplace smaller so the Nazis could take over their home. I tell about the great and lucky escape to London, the many attempts to escape and being turned back until finally my mother, her brother and sister got out in 1938 by getting jobs as servants in the English countryside. But not her parents, my grandparents, Mina and Hugo. They didn't get out. And anyway, they all thought it would be over in six months and they could go home again. I can adjust to everything I always have. I would not tell about what happened to her parents, my grandparents, except that they were killed. I would not tell you when it was or how they got there, what it was like, which line they were in, how long they lived. I would not tell you the details because I could only imagine it, and I have imagined it over and over and always will. I don't like to think about these things. It can happen again. I can adjust to everything. I spent the four years in London. It was my first time away from home. There was a group of us from Vienna, all friends. We had a good time together. We went out dancing every night, 
Then we would sleep in the underground, deep in the subface with everybody else during the blitz. The next morning we would get up and everything was bombed and we would go to work. I would play my mother in the show. I'd walk like her and talk like her. I'd inhabit her, her grandeur, her grandiosity, the fragility she didn't show. I'd walk across the stage like her with her cane marking the way. I'd play Strauss waltzes all through the show, exuberant and filled with joy, and I'd dance like her across the stage the way she used to dance. So then fast forward to uh, the year 2000 when I moved my mother up to Ithaca and she lived here for five years while I was taking care of her. And uh, soon after she moved here, I wrote this piece called Buffalo Wings. I took my mother to Wegmans supermarket. Wegmans is huge and you can get anything you want there. Groceries, socks, blood pressure taken. You can sit at comfortable tables and chairs and eat freshly prepared food off compostable plates. My mother loved Wegmans or Wegmans with her Viennese accent. It was so different than the supermarkets in Queens where she lived for 50 years with their narrow aisles, dirty shelves, sullen, unhappy workers, sawdust on the floors, damaged fruit and nasty customers. Wegmans is a happy place, welcoming and diverse. We decided to have lunch, lunch at Wegmans. Many choices, sushi in a box, Julie Jordan's vegetarian food, Chinese buffet, grilled sandwiches, pasta made to order. And then my mother saw this other section, which was new at the time, pizza and wings, that spicy breaded fried buffalo wings. Her eyes got big and glowed. She told me she never had them before. She wanted them badly. I debated about whether to say something to dampen her thrill or coax her in another direction. You know, something like, they're fried, Ma, for God's sake. You know you shouldn't have them. They're not low fat. You'll have another heart attack. What are you doing? Don't even look at them. I decided against saying anything, knowing it wouldn't do any good. We've been down this road before. It would make her feel bad in any way. She was 86, what the hell. Let her eat whatever she wants. She got the spicy buffalo wings. I watched her eat with gusto and joy as I picked at my own tofu and root vegetables. <laughs> I was amazed at her enthusiasm and zest for life. Suddenly she looked up and said to me, it tastes just like chicken. <laughs> I wondered what she meant as I explained to her that what she was eating was, in fact, chicken. She came back with a resounding, no, it's a buffalo. <laughs> I tried to figure out where to begin. I told her, it's not a buffalo, Ma, it's a chicken. She said to me, how do you know? I told her, Ma, buffaloes don't have wings. <laughs> they aren't birds. She responded with another, how do you know? Maybe they do. She always had the last word. I pictured the hidden wings of the buffalo. I noticed the clear-headed strength in my mother's voice, and I was aware of how weak I sounded in my own explanation. <laughs> buffalo wings. I became aware of the surreal quality of the conversation and the bizarre innocence of my mother the Alice in Wonderland connection to all living creatures who are sacrificed for useless indulgence and misinformed pleasure. I tried to open my heart with love to this woman who raised me, whose values I disagreed with at every turn, who I found silly and funny and strange and arrogant and filled with a joie de vivre and a willingness to discover new things in the world at the age of 86 in my little town. I let her believe in her buffalo wings. <laughs> the next one was a couple of years later, called Broken Ankle. Three years into taking care of my mother, I tripped over my own feet and fell to the ground, breaking my ankle. I was sprained and strained and broken, and my mother drove me crazier than usual. 
I limped over to her apartment at McGraw House Senior Housing. She had a walker and I had my crutches. We were quite a pair. We spent a lot of time screaming, you sit down. No, you sit down. <laughs> my ankle break tapped into our deepest fears that the world is a dangerous place and proved that one wrong move, one wrong step, and everything is destroyed. This was our existential dilemma and the theme of our lives. Weakened as I was by the shattered bones, I was still so much stronger than she was physically. She had so many things wrong with her at the age of 88. Congestive heart failure, shortness of breath, arthritis pain all over, gout, just to name a few. I just had a broken ankle. I could still do things for her, though she fought me constantly. I poured her juice. Sit down, I said. I made her lunch. I don't need anything. I don't want anything. Ma, there was no winning. Emotionally, she beat me to a pulp. She was so upset about my ankle, it was as if she had fallen to the ground. She would rant, life is so unfair. How could this happen to you? You're such a good person, and you're so careful. My whole life, she cautioned me to be careful. It made me quite fearful and neurotic. <laughs> I answered her back, yeah, ma, life is unfair. It's not just about being careful. She didn't buy it. The Holocaust taught her that. Be careful, she said every time I left her apartment, even more than with my broken ankle. One time, leaving her apartment, her walker crashed into my soft cast, and my crutches crashed into the door, and it sounded like a train wreck. We were entwined with each other, and we were going down. We couldn't disconnect. We were a bizarre cat's cradle, a comedy of errors. We couldn't be together, and we couldn't get away from each other. We were Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello. We couldn't stop laughing. I tried to push her up, and I got her in a headlock. She grabbed my arm and twisted. We were like mud wrestlers in the swamp of senior housing. I clawed my way up and out the door, almost tripping again. She yelled down the hallway to me, be careful, darling. I yelled back, stop it, Ma, you're making me nervous. When I got to the street, I was shaking with fear and frustration. Then I went to the acupuncturist. I, I tried to relax with needles all over my <laughs> broken body. The acupuncturist massaged my ankle. She was not afraid. She spoke to me in broken English. She brought the swelling down. She put patches of Chinese herbs all around my ankle. The scent soothed me and calmed me down. As I drifted off, I wished that my mother could get this kind of help with her ailments. I also knew that she would never in a million years allow anybody to touch her in this way. And my heart broke for her. And then the miracle happened. For one moment, lying on that table, I remembered once again that we were not the same person. <laughs> I remembered it like a hit on the head, like an awakening. And then I let go. I drifted into oblivion, the land of Chinese medicine. I accepted my mother for who she was, and I knew my ankle would heal, and I knew that she would not. And I was both grief-struck and grateful at the same time. And then uh, another year or two later, I wrote this one called Ma's Teeth. The last year of my mother's life, she moved into a nursing home. She needed help all the time. And near the end of her life, she lost her teeth. That's her false teeth. They fell right out of her mouth. When you get older, the gums sometimes shrink. Her teeth just slipped out, nowhere to be found. Vanished. Everyone at the nursing home was crawling around the room, looking for them under the bed, in corners, in nooks and crannies. My mother was directing them like the Queen of England. Look over there. Look under that. They were nowhere. She thought they were stolen and melted down, like the Nazis used to do with gold teeth. But her teeth weren't gold, and we don't do that in this country. 
Who would want her teeth anyway? So she got fitted for new ones, but meanwhile, it didn't seem to bother her. Can you eat without them? Did you eat your lunch, I asked her. She said, sure, I was fine. I ate everything. I still have my bottom teeth anyway. My heart opened again to her easy letting go of another layer of basic vanity and hygiene. At that time, my mother was spending hours and hours watching TV shows and news about the Pope at that time, not, not this one or the last one, the one before, who was dying. This was 2005, all day long. It was the Pope, the Pope, the Pope. I said to her, Ma, we're Jewish. What are you doing watching the Pope so much? <laughs> She answered me philosophically, this is the world we live in. This is what we have to watch. He was a good man and he was good to the Jews. I thought of her melted teeth. In a few days, the Pope would be dead and a month later, my mother would die too. I had just bought a new cell phone with a camera that I was still learning how to use. I showed it to my mother and she said to me, you're always spending money. Ma, I needed a cell phone. Who needs a cell phone? Nobody needs a cell phone. She was still living in the old world and she knew better than everybody else, especially me. So I took a picture of her without her teeth to get back at her. <laughs> her white hair was wild and she had a sparkle in her eye. She was gorgeous. She looked at the photo and declared, look, I look just like the Pope. <laughs> And indeed, she did. She looked exactly like the Pope. Ancient and regal and on her way to the next world. I will save that photo forever. And then the last thing I wrote just after she died. Everything reminds me of her. I want to hold on to every moment, every exchange, every memory. I want to hold it deep inside. When my mother was alive, all I wanted to do was be separate and not think about her all the time. Now all I want is to think about her, talk about her, tell her things, visit her, call her on the phone. She was always glad to see me. What are you doing here? She would say. And I would answer, Ma. I'm here every day. <laughs> what used to drive me crazy about her now is only charming, lovely, funny, and sweet. How tricky life is. On that last day, we went downstairs so she could play bingo. She put her chips in order. She loved to gamble, loved to play. She sent me out to get these Viennese wafers that she liked to eat. I barely said goodbye to her when I went to get the wafers. I wanted to get out. I hated bingo. Not anymore. Now bingo is forever special. The game of the gods, the last pleasure, the perfect ending. She was playing bingo. She put her head down and she died. Just like that. Now bingo is the grace that helped her pass, having a good time, easy and gentle. I was holding the wafers in my hand. I was bringing them back to her when I got the call. The whole five years my mother was in Ithaca, I thought our relationship was all about struggle. All my life we were always struggling. But now I see that it really was about healing. I know that she healed me deeply and forever. And all that's left is pure love. I feel her close, so close. And I keep thinking, Mamala, 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 Mamala. Thank you. Thank you all.